Okay, we will formally call the uh, <clears throat> Wenham Finance Committee meeting uh, to order on 12-16 to uh, 2020 at 6.33 p.m. Um, first order of business, if there is anyone in the call loop uh, for community input or community questions. Tom, do you have anybody uh, in the call? Nope. Loop or Jackie? Jim, it's just the FinCom and staff and Catherine, so there's no public at this point in the meeting. Okay. Okay. Very good. Was Kate, was Carrie unable to make it? Ev evidently, the last that I heard from Carrie um, <clears throat> was that um, was yesterday when I sent out to you folks that. She was being tested along with her husband and the rest of her family. Uh, her son uh, evidently is quarantined because he had contact uh, with a infected individual. That happened, sorry, I, I, I must have missed that. And I only asked because I, she was unable apparently to make the last call. I just wanna make sure she was still hanging in there. Yeah, um, she may join us, but I haven't, heard, I haven't heard otherwise today, Alex. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, so um, I do wanna just say, I wanna add to the agenda uh, tonight, a brief discussion on tomorrow night's meeting with the uh, boards of selectmen, the uh, school committee and the uh, Hamilton finance committee. We'll go over that, what the structure is gonna look like and, and how we'll proceed with that as well. So we'll add that to the agenda. All right, number three here then is the uh, follow-up discussion on the FY22 budget overview presentation from last week. So um, questions, comments, observations uh, from that presentation. Uh, for me, I think I made all the comments yesterday, uh, excuse me last week about what we're doing and forecasting. Uh, so I don't really have anything else to add okay. right now. Yeah, I, th I think I'm in the same category. Uh, you know, had a number number of comments and, and, uh, and, and appreciate that we're in the preliminary stages so that, uh, you know, big, Big picture components, inclusive of things like free cash, uh, plugs for uh, the always unknown until January school budget and the like, are are on a preliminary basis, and uh, and that that you know just the departments are getting into into budget planning mode and and things are getting into in gear, but still early stages. Yep. I agree. Susan, any other comments? No, I'm. I mean, there's just a lot to straighten out. So it's like a punch list when the house isn't done, you know. Um, but anyway, <laughs> okay, I'm okay. Thank you. David? I want, do we have a follow-up for the meeting for Iron Rail? <clears throat> that happened a few days ago. That's, that's on the agenda. Oh, uh, it's on the agenda tonight. I've asked for an update on revenues and projections of that. I did talk with... Um, what did I talk with Jackie? I guess Jackie and I spoke about that today. And uh, Gary attended that meeting at four o'clock, David, but there was only one agenda item and they didn't open it up to other agenda items. They just spoke about the, uh, the uh, cell tower uh, uh, discussions and the cell tower program. But um, I do have on here updates regarding the iron rail uh, revenues to date. But we have no updates as far as any documented agreements as far as payment on rent. Right. Has John, John said he was going to do that. Have you heard from him at all? No, I, no, I have not. Um, Gary and I communicated about him attending that meeting at four. Yeah. And, but that was, that's, that's the last that I've heard about it. Tom, do you have any, or Jack, no. do you have any information about any kind of written uh, agreement discussions? 
as far as the rentals or as far as the cell tower? No, not the cell tower. The uh, rental agreements issue. I don't have anything more on that. I don't know, Jackie. I don't think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The other the other question I had regarding the iron rail. Now um, I see expenses and stuff like that. Is the town paying for any cleaning or things like that that are being done on these on these venues where we're not getting any receipts? I mean, is how do, how do they handle the cleaning? Is is it? Does anybody know? Or I mean, I don't want to be spending money on something that we're not getting anything back from. Uh, Susan, are you talking COVID related or just general cleaning? Just general cleaning at the Iron Rail. In other words, I don't know if cleaning is in their contract. I don't know how it how it works over there. And and if cleaning is in their contract then I definitely don't think we should be paying for things like that if we're not receiving any rent. Jackie, um, you got your hand, hand up I there. Just, I, before Susan started, I did have one thing. So um, looking at the iron rail, um, I do wanna clarify that any written agreement would have to be entered into between the entirety of the select board and the tenants. So the current structure is that the select board are the landlords. So and the Iron Rail Commission are kind of like the property management company. So just for folks to understand, uh, something in writing would have to be done based on an agreement with like a taken through a vote of the Board of Selectmen. So I did look into that after last week's meeting. Um, and Susan, in regards to the cleaning contract, um, we do an annual contract with a cleaning service and they do um, the common areas of the building, hallways, uh, bathrooms, they empty the trash out. Um, so I can speak to Bill Tyak. I don't know if there's a way to section out a particular tenant or two from that contract. Um, we are in a signed like multi-year agreement with the cleaning company themselves. Okay. Um, but I can certainly ask Bill Tyak. He is the one that works on the facility with our facilities director on those types of procurements. So I can certainly find out if that's something we can look into as we proceed if, if we're not successful with written agreements. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question, Jackie. I, I recall, as you were describing just now, that the cleaning company with which we've contracted, that was like maybe a year or so ago. Didn't we make a change from like maybe facilities director work to the cleaning company and things were going well in that regard? Yeah. We, and also um, for town hall and the like. Yeah, you're correct, Alex. So we had had um, a part-time employee doing janitorial services and there was some significant cost savings in having a contracted company come in. Uh, it also provided us with some stability because they could, uh, you know, have staff that could sub in if some, you know, someone was sick or something. Uh, it's the same group that are doing town hall, the fire station, the police station, and the COA. But because of the nature of the Iron Rail, we do have a separate contract agreement for that building versus the other municipal buildings. Thank you. And I just thought that that was useful information just at large for how the cleaning yeah. uh, arrangement works. Um, and just a, a quick comment. So thanks for uh, confirming that it would be the select board who would be point on any written agreement um, versus, I suppose, Iron Rail Commission. That doesn't surprise me. And uh, but I, but I don't think it's particularly relevant. I think we we the, the three parties being the Iron Rail Commission, the select board and FinCom, I think are at different stages of feeling the urgency of this one, it feels like. Yeah. Um, whereas the Iron Rail Commission hasn't, it sounds like, and I admittedly have not followed along with their meetings, but where it does, it, it feels like we're not on the receiving end of information or updates from them. Uh, perhaps they're not feeling as compelled to take the next step, which I think we've through emails uh, as a committee uh, and in discussion have made pretty clear we feel is appropriate, which is to have a formal agreement documented. I don't, I'm not asking for anything where we're calling attorneys or believe it or not, after my uh, comments last week, I'm not necessarily even suggesting we, we throw padlocks in the place, but we, the next step is to have something basic and formal, which is a written agreement. So I would hope that through uh, TA urging and through FinCom chair urging, we can make that happen as soon as possible. Cause this has been probably well over a month since we, 
first learned of it. And of course, yeah. at that stage, we were already many, many months in arrears. Right. So we just need, we, I don't know what else we need to do as a committee to, to stress the kind of importance of at least taking a step towards documenting written agreement. Um, if, if council needs to look at it for a quick, you know, whatever, I'm not suggesting a change to the lease. I'm not suggesting, you know, select board take over changes in committees or anything like that. I'm just suggesting that we get something documented. Yeah, Tom? I agree. Thank Tom? you, uh, Jim. Uh, Jackie, uh, pre-COVID, and I apologize uh, for the questions, more for my own information. Prior to COVID, were we having problems with the RIAs uh, with, with them before? No. It's just basically a COVID. Okay. And, and I will say that I know um, Margaret Hoffman in our planning office, as well as Anthony and Salby when he was here, were sending them any grant opportunities that we were made aware of, any small business, you know, all of like the, the paycheck stabilization programs, small businesses could buy into anything that we were getting from the Commonwealth, um, I know was being forwarded by um, staff to the uh, Iron Rail Commission, as well as to the tenants. Um, so from my understanding, we, we tried to communicate any opportunity that they were eligible for to the tenants. Thank you. Do we have any updates, uh, Jamie, on, on what our revenues have been to date compared to, uh, okay, here we go. Yes, I put the spreadsheet together. Um, and you can tell that Provost says consistent, the, um, that Annex Local 28 has been consistent, the plan has been consistent, youth soccer paid their dues, Penguin Call just sent in 500. Um, there was a small payment in July for WAGs for just over $1,000. And then there was a payment again in December for $2,200. Um, and then the gymnastics, we just got a check uh, last week for $4,000. But to date, we have 30, just under $35,000, where that's not even, I'm pretty sure it's not even a third of what it should be. Okay, so so year to date, we're at 34,618. Yep. And if we were at our full uh, reimbursements, what would that amount be? Do we have that? Just I so don't I can have compare. that amount. I can get back to you on that amount. I don't have it right okay. now. Okay, I just want to compare yep. the 34,6 to where we should be. Would be if it wasn't. Uh, we weren't struggling with the, uh, the the loss of business and the loss of rentals. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jamie. You're welcome. If so I may ask that that we're, we're, we're at a did you say a fraction, Jamie? A, I, mean, I mean, have we collected a third? Or, you know, I, half. We are under a third. Under a third. Yeah, and where it's concerning because we're halfway through the fiscal year. Well, just about halfway through the fiscal year. So uh, typically we would be looking at 150, 140,000. Yeah, that's what we have roughly a hundred number. And so we're headed into a, well, we're, we're, let's, let's say we got 40,000 uh, after uh, five months. So that equates to maybe 50,000 for six months. Is, is, is that, am I? Would we collect a hundred thousand bucks this year, maybe, if we're going on the same trend we are now? I thought it was like a hundred and forty. Am I crazy? No, no, no it's a hundred and forty. It would be bad. Right. It would not hit. Yeah. But what I'm trying to just get a little bit of a number, a sense is of where we are now, and if we projected a straight line projection out for twelve months, what that number would look like for this year, so we can think about FY twenty two. Okay. So I think. Judge by last year's numbers, it, we were at in in the 90s. So my guess is we might fall someplace in there again. Okay. We budgeted in the uh, initial uh, preliminary budget uh, a loss of $100,000, if I remember correctly. Jackie? Um, well, and the other thing that I just wanted to remind you about, Jim, is this 140 number we're talking about is the revenue of the general fund for the Iron Rail Commission. So we also, the first $30,000, which we've now collected, goes into the revolving fund, which pays the ban that we have done for the capital a few years ago. So now okay. at least we're not going to be using town funds to subsidize the ban payment. 
mm-hmm. um, but that's where it just puts actually an even starker deficit on the general fund revenue that we would expect from that property. So just so folks, you know, I, I don't want to ever forget that ban because uh, it'll right. always come due in uh, May, but at least we now can cover the cost of that revolving fund ban. Okay. If, if, if I may. Go back to, I'm sorry, Alex, go ahead. Thanks, Jim. Um, Jamie, if you wouldn't mind um, sending that spreadsheet uh, when appropriate with the details that you just shared a moment ago. Yes, I will. Um, thank you very much. I think it showed, um, you know, to your point, a payment by WAGS in July and then one in December. Um, you know, they're, 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 it's no surprise because of how far we, and I know there are other tenants, at least one other tenant that's significantly behind and there are larger, largest tenants. So it's no surprise to see the inconsistency based on the dollar amount that we're behind. But I've been thinking about this. So Jackie brought up the issue of the ban. We've got capital, I'm going to say commitments, at least in the form of a plan, um, with annual allocations from the annual from the iron rail rental income to the tune of twenty five or thirty thousand a year, something like that towards the capital plans. We've got meaningful capital expenditures um, that have taken place, the paving and the signage and maybe one other thing I forget. Um, the roof. The roof, thank you. So good capital outlay to improve and keep the, the property viable, more planned in the form of an expensive septic system, which will have to be done regardless and like whether it was vacant or, or occupied um, with rent paying tenants. My point is that this is a, a long-term asset of the towns that generates income, critical income, meaningful income, and has always been dubbed a bright spot fiscally in an otherwise dire situation the past few years, at least. So I, 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 I really think that action needs to be taken. And if there is, to the extent that the Iron Rail Commission and or Board of Selection don't take action, I'm wondering if there's recourse as to, well, maybe the Iron Rail Commission shouldn't have that capital. I mean, maybe we should make changes to the, to the plans. I mean, if we're not going to enforce the collection of rents, we can't improve the property. Right. Uh, the town is going to be on hook. Taxpayers are now going to be on hook for the bans, which they were told in various town meetings, I'm certain, because I'm sure they voted on this, these appropriations and these plans that, hey, the iron rail rental income is going to pay for these bans. So now you're on the hook, taxpayers, for the debt for these projects that were supposed to be paid for with rent. Not to mention my earlier comment about we're subsidizing, um, you know, businesses and, and, and also in the fairness or lack thereof of, of of, to the rent paying tenants. So um, I'm going to leave it at that, but there, there are other longer term implications that I hadn't thought about. And the debt is one of them and the capital is another that's going to play out more. This is just more than a wrinkle because we're behind, you know, hundred grand on 140 and it's, it's real serious. So I would very much appreciate if, um, uh, if we could compel the select board to take action. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, I, Jim. Um, I will follow up with Gary again. I'll pull up the uh, email that I sent him outlining our our thoughts and our recommendations of about, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago now. And uh, impress upon him our concerns about both the investments and we're making in capital and where this is all going or not going or, or conversely not going. Great, yeah. thank you. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jackie, off the top of your head, uh, how long are these leases remaining? Um, maybe two years offhand. Maybe. Okay, three. I think it's two more years. Okay. Uh, but the ban, I think, has eight years to go. Do you think it would be worth FinCom making a motion? if we could to encourage the selectmen and the Iron Rail Commission to take action to encourage payment of rent with that. I'm kind of looking for some sort of a, a spur here to kick the thing and, and make it happen faster than it seems to be happening. Like a FEMCOM executive order kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it would at least be, yeah, I, it's not a bad idea. I would support it from the standpoint of being, uh, you know, an action symbolic of our, you know, commitment to seeing some, you know, something take place. And, and our, I, I think it should be accompanied 
by an offer to help too. If there's, yeah. a, if, if someone wants any of us to take a stab at uh, the language or, or, or do some of the calculations, you know, some potential options with which a repayment could take place. I mean, this is simple stuff. Any, anyone can do this, right? In terms of how much right. is owed over, right. over X time period going forward. I'm assuming, Mr. Chairman, that none of them are on a payment plan right now. No. Actual payment plan, nothing. Okay. There's no. That's right. There's no. The agreements extend back to the to the prior the existing contracts, but there's been no adjustments in any kind of written uh, uh, format uh, going forward with with reduced payments or partial payments. And agreements about making that, that that doesn't exist. That's right. I also don't know in the rental agreements if there's any language regarding um, interest for payments in arrears or or anything like that. But um, I don't. I I would just like us to get on record that we really tried to push this thing. And if nothing happens, then people can't come back and say, "Well, you know, you guys didn't do anything." Um, mm -hmm. The other question I have for both Jamie and Jackie, and this is, you know, informationally for me, is there anything in the facilities that they would be taxed on for personal property? Oh, I th would think so. Uh, with all the gymnastics um, equipment and, and I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I can confirm, but I would imagine personal property, yes. I think that would... I think the gymnastics for sure. I don't know if anybody else has enough of anything of significance. You know, I, I wonder, even with the gymnastics, you know, I, I think we're talking dollars, not hundreds. Yeah. Um, okay. We could certainly get a report from Steve, though, um, Amy, because I think the other thing, too, is that the, um, there might be personal property for um, the Boy Scout barn as well, maybe. People have it though. I can look into that and get back to everyone. Too. There's no, there's no revenue from the Boy Scout barn, correct? No, there is. That's um, that's the number twenty-eight that we saw on the spreadsheet a minute ago. Oh. Um, because there's um, um, the annex floor to local twenty-eight. Um, so that's the. There, there's a, actually a musical group that rents part of the space in the, the annex of the second floor of the Boy Scout oh. barn. Oh, this okay. is from the musical group. So that's part of local 28. Okay. Oh, Boy Scout chapter 28. Is that what that refers to? I believe so. Yes. Oh. <laughs> um, but this is the, this is like a mu it's a musical group. They're a band. Uh, a barn band or a garage band. Okay. So when when the revenue came in from the gymnastics and from WAGS, was it noted on the checks what what month that was to be applied to? I'm just curious as to how you applied that cash to the account. So for WAGS, no. I, so I when I as I've been getting them, I've been emailing Lou just to let him know. But for WAGS, no. For the gymnastics, the initial thousand dollars he sent, he wrote July on it, and then for December he wrote three thousand. And um, the three thousand comes from remember when we talked in the prior meetings that Lou said that he they were going to try to put three thousand dollars a month, so they're not as behind. But it wasn't in writing, so I think that was what the three thousand for December was. But the thousand dollars they just wrote July. I don't know if he had talked okay. to Lou about that or what, but I did email Lou and made him aware. Yeah. But then I didn't really get much feedback other than, okay. <laughs> would someone, would, uh, would, one, of the, would one of the uh, folks want to make a motion uh, and to encourage the uh, Board of Selectmen and the Iron Rail Commission? to, um, I'm, I'm trying to put the words together here, to formally uh, develop language that would uh, commit to a future payment plan, something to that effect. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. 
but I think somebody else should say it because I, I'm not that eloquent. So somebody else should craft that. You just sounded great, but. Well, I, I think you're both on the right track, Susan. It was your idea, so. I, yeah, but can you do it? You're better. I don't know about that, <laughs> Jim. I think you had, I, th I think. Okay. I think the motion I'm, I'm, would, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be in the form of like, I don't want to, I, I do think it would come to be in the form of a written agreement, but I think just something even more general, like take immediate action to address the significant revenue shortfall okay. from rental income, the tenants and so forth, you know, to, and, okay. and to formalize plans to blah, blah, blah. Okay. I'll make, I, I'll I can, make, I can, or you can, but you're, you, you're doing I'll make, great. I'll so. make the motion. Uh, the okay. Finance Committee strongly encourages <clears throat> the Wenham Board of Selectmen and the Iron Rail Commission to document uh, adjusted rental income from all the tenants at the Iron Rail for fiscal year 22 uh, to address the shortfalls that we're experiencing year to date and to project the income available to the town of Wenham for fiscal year 21. Is that? Catherine? Catherine? I got it. You got it? <laughs> okay. I got it. <laughs> okay. I think I covered it. <clears throat> But you said for fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 21. It should well, be both 21, I think, shouldn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I said for, for, to project this year. Oh, okay. Fiscal year 21, yeah. And then we can pick it up again to think about uh, fiscal year 22. Okay. And, that, and that's a motion? That's a motion. On the floor? On the floor, yes. Okay, I'll second that motion. Okay, any and, further and, comments or additions or questions? My only question is, so maybe Catherine could help here because uh, Jim, I think it was great and I was following along as best I could in terms of the wording. If I'm on the receiving end of, uh, of this, uh, of information that FinCom, if it were to support this motion, their specific request is to project the most, the last one was to project the flows. First one was to, I think, document the shortfalls and I just want to make sure that there's something in there about taking act, taking appropriate action to. I can't come up with the words. Do you want me to read the motion again? Sure. Sorry, Sorry. I don't mean to belabor this any more than I already have. Sure. Um, the finance committee strongly encourages the board of selectmen and Iron Rail Commission to document adjusted rental income from all tenants at Iron Rail for fiscal year 22 to address the shortfalls year to date and to project the income available to the town of Wenham for fiscal year 21. I Thank think it should much. be fiscal year 21 on both, shouldn't it? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree with that, Catherine. The only, that when, when, I, when you have fiscal year 22, let's make it 21. Right. We're just looking yep. at this current activity for the next uh, seven months. Okay, so the motion's been made. Uh, I don't. I don't think we had a formal second to the motion. Or no, did, we did. I, I we did. did. Second, and if, did. And if it's consider a second it again, if it's amended. Second. We've yep. had discussion. Yep. Uh, David, are you there? We'll give him a sec. We'll give him a second to get back. And and also, I just want to Here's state David. for the record. There's David. I just okay. want to say for the record that I, well, I can hear you through the ear. I just went to get some water. So I, I was just going to say real quickly that I, I, I think you covered it 100%, Jim, because you said address the uh, revenue shortfall. And that's what I was looking for, that opening to just address right. it, however they best see fit. Right. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. So we've, we've got a motion. We've got a second. We've had discussion. All those in favor of the motion with your hands. Hi, Jim. Hi, David. Hi. Hi, Susan. Hi, Alex. Okay. Catherine, you got you got that, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. I do, thank you. 
Can, can we go back just for a, a half a minute to the FY22 budget overview? We kind of jumped around and got on the iron rail, which is fine. Right. But I, I just have one comment about uh, the fiscal year 22, which I think maybe at some point tomorrow uh, to insert into the discussion with the school committee. And that is, that's two things. One, the recommendation from our audit and as well as the Department of Revenue best practices that was referenced in what Jackie and uh, Jamie pulled together was the whole issue about stabilization fund reserve accounts. Um, if I remember correctly, we haven't contributed to the stabilization fund for 18 or 19 years. Um, there is a strong recommendation in the audit to consider um, uh, a, a plan uh, to use our free cash to begin to build up our reserve and uh, stabilization accounts. I did a little review also for the last three years. Let's see. We have, oh, here we go. From free cash to, and the other, the other recommendation is to reduce, if you can, free cash to fund operations. And in fiscal year 18, we use 76% of our free cash to fund operations. Uh, in FY19, we used 70. Repeat that number, Jim. I'm sorry. Fiscal year 18? Yeah. We use 76% of free okay. cash to fund ops. FY19, we use 78%. In FY20, we used, we did better, we used about 50% to fund operations. I think that's an important point to make to the community. And the fact that we are, you know, the more you dip into, and it has the potential evidently, as was discussed in the, the audit report of, it hasn't yet, but it could impact our bond rating. So I think that this is a, you know, a whole area that, the town has to pay attention to and begin to consider how we're going to go forward with this with this with this issue of use of free cash. We haven't had our free cash certified year to date. Is that is that right, Jamie? Correct. They are working on tax recaps right now, so they're not looking at right. um, balance sheets. Everything's submitted. I'm just waiting for them to approve. Yep. So anyway, I, I, that's, a, that's just a comment. This is a, it's an observation that I, I just wanted to, to make. I think it's, a, it's something that we have to, we aren't putting pennies in the savings bank anymore. Right. I agree, okay. but I think, I don't know how we don't get around at this point not using it. Well, we'll have to look and see what, I mean, the free cash press for the last several years has been the school budget, yeah. which then presses on our town budget to try to meet the town budget basic obligations. And that's where we've been using a lot of our free cash or to lower the tax rate, you know. The, so I, I think, um, look, is it gonna end up, is it gonna end up zero uh, use of free cash? I don't, you know, to, to fund ops, are we gonna get down to zero? I, I don't know, but I'm, I think it's something we just need to keep on the, uh, in front of us. That's, that's why I'm raising it. Okie dokie. Okay. Can I make a quick comment, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, I think that the, um, the stabilization fund, I know we talked about using a little bit of it, and I know I'm gonna bounce a little bit around here. There's free cash stabilization and special purpose stabilization. Um, free cash, I think I, I made the point last week that it's tough tough to get away from and we've done a, a, a noble job so far of, of cutting it back. Um, we'll see what we end up with this year. Stabilization fund at large, how much, do we have 500,000? Is that right? Call it that. We can't tap into it really, right? We, I mean, it, you, we're kind of, well, we, we could, but we made, the, we made the pretty quick, we came to the quick conclusion a year or two ago, like we can't go there because it's just not gonna solve any problems long-term. Adding to it is obviously exceptionally difficult under these circumstances. But the real point I wanted to make was on the um, stabilization fund special purpose for enrollment shift. If there's oh, any yeah. interest in that whatsoever, I, it was 
it was bothering me that I couldn't figure out uh, what one of the reasons for not using it was. Um, some of you may remember this, um, Jim, David, maybe Jackie, but from Peter's time, we did consider this. And uh, from, from a budget update uh, dated February 19th of 2019, which actually doesn't seem like it's that long ago, um, there was a, a short comment about the use of a, of, of a revenue, I'm sorry, of a enrollment shift special purpose stabilization, which we could draw from fund at point, you know, time zero, and then draw from later to help us pay for the enrollment shift uh, or, or the increase in regional school district costs attributed specifically to the enrollment shift for that special purpose. But at the time we were up against $177,000 enrollment shift increase. And the point he raised, and I can forward this to everybody, but I'll kind of paraphrase, is that you, you can cover that cost, but um, you're still stuck with those expenses in the following fiscal year. So you're, in, you might, you're gonna lower right. your override. So you're only increasing your override by a much smaller amount on the revenue side. And then you're stuck with that, you know, little, little bit of levy capacity and that enrollment shift for the following year. So all you're doing is kind of, it's just, it's just a one-time, right, hit. And you're, you're only going to have that expense baked in the following year, all else right. equal. So it makes perfect sense, but we hadn't really reached that conclusion when it sounded nice. And uh, that's all I got, Jackie. Well, I just yeah. want to um, piggyback off what Alex was talking about because I, I was there for those discussions as well about, you know, at some point we might not be in a year where we're hurting as bad and it might be something that we would think about investing in. But I think bigger picture, it's something I would want to remind the FinCom about as well on that topic is that that, as Alex pointed out, is a short term solution. It buys you a little bit in the years that, you know, Hamilton is feeling the pain and we're not. Uh, but it doesn't help you make up financial ground structurally uh, because at some point it'll swing back to us. Um, so something to think about for the FinCom is that I know the joint select board meeting between Hamilton and Wenham did discuss reaching out to the school committee about reopening the regional agreement at some point. And that actually would be a, a big picture structural way of looking at that issue. Um, currently we have that three year rolling average, but I know there's been some discussion about potentially making it a five-year rolling average and obviously when you're on the good side of the enrollment shift you know three is better than five but we've been on the negative side more often than not the last few years so um just something for you to consider walking into tomorrow night's meeting if that's something that you're thinking about policy-wise um in terms of opening that agreement maybe maybe i could uh we could talk about that when we talk about the uh, the meeting uh, tomorrow night with what what I understand so far uh, as the agenda. Can we have uh, Jackie, uh, Jamie, Tom, an update on the library roof uh, development process uh, that there's been a joint committee working on this? Uh, between the two communities and it's you've kind of we've kind of if I understand it correctly scrapped if you will the original plan and the bid and are looking at additional work to be done solar panels the recreation <laughs> building um, so I can start and then I'll be <laughs> glad to pass it along to Jamie and Tom just to because I was here last year and I helped work on the initial project. So we had budgeted money for this year for the roof. Um, so we used uh, free cash at our special town meeting in October to budget for the full project for the library roof at the time. Um, however, the way that the assessments were worked out over the summer uh, by the accountant at the time, he um, had already assessed Hamilton for their share. So Hamilton is already paying us through the revenue of the assessment for their share of the library roof, and now we've appropriated it with free cash. However, um, we have a joint energy manager between the two towns of Hamilton and Wenham, and they did a study looking at solar for municipal buildings in the two communities. Out of all the municipal buildings in Wenham, the library is the only one that has any potential, and that includes, um, I did ask Vicki, you know, fire police and town hall, but also COA and the iron rail actually, um, because that's got a nice new roof on it. So I said, it'd be great, but there's too much tree cover. 
Uh, so Vicki has been working with the town of Hamilton because they had several municipal buildings eligible for solar. So the goal would be to um, do the library roof, do the rec roof, both of which have normal roof needing maintenance issues. Um, nothing, no major leaks yet, but they're both about 20 years old. It's about time and they are starting to have some small issues better to deal with the smaller issues before they become bigger issues. But in the meantime, this other solar project has been developing too. So the thought process is we've already allocated the first 75 for the library. There would be a, additional costs to um, bring it up to the standard for solar. But if we went in and brought the, did the corrections to the rec roof and did the upgrades to the library roof, put solar on both, then we would start to see some cost savings to both towns uh, because it would cover roughly 80% of the library's energy needs, which is not an insignificant utility given the library and how much more technology is utilized in the lights and everything. So in non-pandemic times, it'll actually cover about 80% of the library's energy costs. Um, What's the payback? Oh, sorry, Jackie, I thought you were done. Oh, no, it's okay. I just was going to turn it over to Jamie to speak to like how this would work with the payments on when we would get the payments. So, I think you're asking though what payback to the timeline, correct? Yeah, well, sometimes these things have 20 year paybacks. Mm. Um, so from my understanding, um, obviously you don't start getting the payback until um, the solar panels are on the roof. And Vicki Missoni, um, our energy manager did make a presentation to the select board last night. So at this point, the solar project is in the stage where the last night the select board voted to sign the letter of intent to move forward with our local procured utility company on designing the project. Um, so we don't have estimates on the buyback yet. The goal is that we will have an update for you at our January 9th meeting. Um, but basically we've locked in a competitive rate with our provider and the next steps will be, um, it's too soon to get a sense of the analysis over time. But I know Vicki did say last night, as soon as she has it, we'll, we'll get it. Um, and, and, and Jackie, excuse me, I didn't, I didn't mean to come off so biting on that. Okay. Uh, uh, you didn't. Uh, sorry. I We're all stuck in quarantine. I, I take yeah, everybody yeah. with a grain of salt at this point. Yeah, but we like to be better on FinCom. But, um, so I, I think that's a good thought to have. And I have sustainability and pays back. If it has a 10, 15, 20 year payback, then I don't think it's financially viable at this time, but we'll wait for the numbers to see how they come back. Yeah, and I, I wanna clarify, David, there's been no contract. It's just a letter of intent that allows us to lock yeah. in some competitive rates. Um, I think the, I, I wanna ask Jamie to speak up because she's now been in these meetings with me as well, that um, it, did, it did identify for us um, a systemic issue that we have in terms of facilities planning for this building, because it's one building, two departments, and each community is a, a lead so we have the, we're the lead on the library they're the lead on the rec right. so i think yeah. this has been a really great um early early integration for jamie because she's been able to work with marissa uh the hamilton finance director on addressing this in the the two imas going forward jamie do you want to speak to that a little bit yeah so like jackie said we are the lead on library and hamilton is the lead on rec so and those two agreements are they're, the way they're calculated is different. So Marissa and I have to figure out a way to work on an IMA just for capital for the building to treat the building as one. Right now it's estimated roughly 300,000 where we have 75. So we'd still have to come up with a 225, but what we're working on now is the breakout of that 225. So who, what portion is, what I'm gonna pay and what portion um, Hamilton's going to pay. Right now, we don't have those numbers, but that's what we're trying to work on. And I think the other thing to consider as well is why we're looking to systemically address the IMA is at this point, because the two different communities are separately acting as leads, we have different cleaning companies. Um, we have different IT companies. We have different other maintenance companies. Um, both buildings each have their own different style of roof and different style of HVAC. Um, but by combining together, we may see some additional cost savings 
for other areas of those two departmental budgets. So we won't know what the analytics are yet for the solar project, and we're not necessarily in a place where we're pitching you the new roof yet. Um, but the goal would be is that if we, when we do pitch the new roof with the solar, it would be for, you know, we'd have our library budget and our rec budget, and then we'd have a new line that is for the library rec building. So that way we're treating it separately from those departmental budgets so that it's a more holistic facilities approach to that building, to that physical structure, instead of, you know, what the library's doing over here, what the rec's doing over here, and trying to have two different communities as two different leads go through their capital processes with two different halves of the same building. It's just not working. So this definitely identified a systemic issue for us that we'll be able to move forward to be able to fix going forward for future projects, which is, is one good good thing. I know the I know the number's high. Um, <laughs> I know it's high. Um, I know. Um, and we can on January 9th we'll have we can't afford it. Sorry. You can't yeah. afford it, right? <laughs> we'll have a full outlook of quotes for you. Um, even regardless of the solar, we obviously still need to do the library repairs that we've already planned for. Um, and the rec, I would imagine, will still have a, some kind of request for the rep some of the more minor repairs to their roof. Um, so, you know, it's still a, an early capital assessment. You know, I don't think it's fair to, to judge the capital yet until we get more of a picture. And Kim and Sean, uh, Kim Butler and Sean Timmons will certainly be in to see you um, to go over the finer details of the project along with our facilities director, Mike Hardy. But I think, you know, it shows a, an issue that I think has been longstanding, which is we don't treat capital for that building very well. And this, hopefully Jamie and Marissa can, can find a new plan going forward for when we do get these requests. Alex. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Jackie, thanks for all that information. It sounds like this whole thing snowballed way the heck I mean, it, it's great to have a, a, an agreement for the, the building, right? The building, you, you, you're up against a complex thing. You start peeling back these layers. And you're like, oh, you got two entities in this thing, right? You got one address, one roof, two entities shared by two towns. One's lead, the other one's lead. Add in the FinComs, add in facilities, add in everybody. But the point was to just put a roof on the thing. And we allocated money from a budgetary standpoint. We got 75 grand for that, right? So where did like, and now all of a sudden we're contemplating changing it. Like that's what FinCom approved. That's what the, or, excuse me, that's what FinCom recommended. And that's what voters approved. So, and now we have like 19 different entities it, beginning with the energy uh, consultant whose job it is to pick the most viable, even if it's not preferable roof upon which to place solar panels in town. Like you said, that's the only one that might even work. Doesn't mean that we should. And like, who, who's, who's driving it here? Do you know what I mean? Like, there's so many, like, I understand that we're going to say, okay, let's, let's get a study in place, lock in some competitive rates. But to David's point, we need to see the numbers before, before this is even entertained for any, and so what are we doing? Are we moving forward with a new roof yet? And then it's my one question. And then the only other comment I'll make is you can add solar at any time. There's nothing special, but you have a good roof. You can put solar on it. it do it later. It'll be more efficient and cheaper might have fewer government credits as that money dries up. More efficient and cheaper, ultimately. Let's get a grant if we can get it. And we, or and get fundraising towards it or something from the library. And Hamilton, mm -hmm. just because Hamilton's view, sorry, David, you're absolutely right, but just because Hamilton's view might be all pro-solar, too, doesn't mean that we necessarily would be for this particular project. Yeah, I think we wanted to um, give you an update, because and Jim had requested an update. Um, the free cash that we appropriated to the library roof is still there. That is still a functioning alternative. And because we've allocated it with free cash, unlike an operating budget, we, we don't lose that, you know, come July 1 because right. it's free cash. So right. we do have a bit of a moment. And I would say I wouldn't recommend moving forward to that level of construction project until we're maybe further out of the pandemic, just because I know from the Longfellow Road construction project alone, materials costs are at a premium right now. So we point. do have a little bit of time right now to contemplate and you know what town meeting has appropriated is what we go by uh, but i think that's where we have established this working group to have this discussion prior to um our more refined budgets um because i think it is you know to your point alex we do need to have a discussion about where the lead is coming from and having you know one community take the lead on the building so that a project like this you know there's not 
one thing going on over here and one thing going on over there. And then all of a sudden there's, you know, 14 people on a Zoom. But we do have this working group established and we brought Tom in. And at some point, I'm hoping he'll be able to speak to it. Um, but it's only week three, so we still don't want to scare him away either. Um, but now with John, uh, Tom and Jamie on board, um, as well as the management in Hamilton, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can find something in the IMA so that we have a plan for this going forward of who's taking the lead on managing this physical plant on this building, but also still continue to, to explore the options for this project and if it's the right fit for both communities going forward. So I think it's still early days, um, but you know, if we were to um, move forward with solar, it's good that we've now locked in the more competitive rates. You know, it could be that, you know, this doesn't go anywhere. It's a letter of intent, it's not a contract. Um, but at least if we do move forward, we've maximized our, our capacity, if, if that's the decision that the two um, select boards decide to go with. May I ask a question? So sure, sure. On, the, on the library roof, when, when a number was assigned to it, I assume that number was based on bids to do the work, right? On quotes, we don't... Um, Sorry, this is a technical thing. It's, they're not bids until we actually formally go out for the procurement. They're based. But on then, quotes. how did you assign it? Okay, so so they're yeah, so they're based quotes. on quotes. Yep. Um, asphalt, being that petroleum is so cheap right now, is pretty cheap. And I would assume on the rec building, I think it must be like a built-up roof. Is that correct? Is it tar and gravel? Uh, just a rubber roof. It's rubber. Yeah. Okay, oh, but I mean, my concern is is that those prices are continuing to go up, and we're we're losing time, kind of looking at the solar thing. And so, I think you could be kind of squeezed here. You see what but I mean? I do. Um, I think to me, my higher concern is not so much in materials costs right now, but as in labor costs. We have to deal with prevailing wage. Um, so, and there's only so many companies that do municipal projects like this. Um, so right. I think and the prevailing wage goes up again on July 1st. So after July 1st, everything's going to get more expensive because the prevailing wage goes up. Yep. Um, and I think that just, I think, you know, we just have this opportunity to have the discussion right now. Um, and then still well before July one, do the procurement on the library roof when, when they, when needed. Um, I don't think we're missing too much. I don't think we're losing ground on this particular project yet. I think obviously we want to lock something up between January and February of what the plan going forward is as we think about 21 and 22. Um, but I think, you know, I think the two select boards have heard about this project. Um, and I think you know, we want to make sure you're informed, um, but nothing is decided at this point. Um, we'll still at some point proceed with our normal, you know, work for procurement for it um but now with you know we did have a bit of an earlier winter and so you know we can only do so much during this time of year with outdoor capital projects so that's kind of where we are okay so so i guess just a few maybe a few comments that i have to, to maybe wrap this up one we will have a ton uh, jackie and jamie will have a time frame uh, at some point when we'll have uh, clear numbers and a breakout of costs for Hamilton and Wenham over the next X weeks or months, if that would be very, very helpful. I mean, we, we will need that by, at least by the end of January, February. Is that possible? I think, I think we'll have a solid expense layout for the budget meeting on January 9th on budget day. Okay. Um, Tom, did you speak with Vicki today about when we'll, we'll, she'll have an analysis on um, the cost savings. Did you check in after last night's meeting with her today? The cost saving? Oh, no. No, no. so we can certainly reach out and get an answer on when we'll have those figures as well. We'll okay. get you everything you need. So, I mean, that, that, that'll that be a, th those numbers will be important because it's kind of complicated between the rec roof, shared costs for the library roof. Can we do this project in phases like Alex was maybe suggesting, get the roofs done, and then maybe in 22 or 23 calendar years do the solar, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing it out there in terms of projected costs and so on. 
Um, the, the other thought I had, and I'm, I, I would guess that the, this committee, Jackie and Jamie, given that it's a regional, the only regional library in the state, would we be eligible for any particular uh, unique kind of funding from, from the state for this project? I do know, if, I don't know if this, if there, the state is really funding at this point any construction work under the Board of Library Commissioners. I um, mean, they were doing some minimal funding years ago for new libraries. I don't know if they're doing anything for. I wonder if I could, have, I mean, given, I think we're in just a unique position being the only regional library in the state. I wonder if that gives us any advantage of some kind. And funding, maybe it just could be asked or explored. It may not be at all. Yeah, I can look into it and, and ask and talk to other colleagues and see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we'll keep this in front of us uh, starting in January, uh, Jackie. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think we'll have a, a full a full report for the FinCommy and the Select Board at, okay. by that point in time. Uh, I think we'll also have ironed out who's going to take the lead on the building. Yeah. At that time, maybe it won't be in writing, but I think that's that's going to be a big goal um, for part of this project is determining which community and, and which department um, of that community is going to take the formal lead on projects of this nature going forward. Okay, and and at that and and during that uh, that decision will uh, will define administratively who will be oversight for the one. The whole, the whole two buildings. And administratively and in terms of execution of both projects. Right, okay. All right. Um, on the agenda next is the uh, Saturday budget day on January 9th and the budget uh, book electronic format. Do we have a schedule? We don't have a schedule yet for January 9th, I, I would. I, I'm, I'm guessing because I haven't seen one, but. Um, no, so we'll have department heads start signing up over the coming week or so. Um, for, just for folks to put on their calendars, typically we do get started at about 8.30 um, in the morning. And then I think the latest, I don't know, typically we're wrapped up between one and two o'clock. So I would hope to do that similarly. Um, we'll do that on Zoom. Um, Jamie and I, you know, we did take a poll at the last meeting on what folks would like in terms of hard copy or electronic format. But something that we wanted to talk to the FinCom about is what your appetite might be. Um, there are several different companies that offer programs that assist smaller municipalities and bigger municipalities with their budget books and with their budget documents. Um, so as members of the FinCom will probably remember with um, the exception, I think of Susan, who's new, um, we have the last two or three years received the GFOA Distinguished Budget Award, um, which is a huge, um, a huge accomplishment for a municipality of our size because you know the budget team is is pretty much everyone on this Zoom. Um, we don't have a lot of capacity there, so it's really great. Um, but we do really rely on interns and volunteers in the Senior Tax Work Off program to assist with assembling budget books, keeping everything printed. Um, and we, with COVID, we don't have that capacity this year. Uh, so Jamie and I were looking at a software. We we attended, um, we each watched a demo for a software that takes your software reports and your Excel spreadsheets and prints your budget book for you. Um, and it updates it on the web and it also for your website. And it also uh, creates a version that you can just hit print on for your members who want a hard copy. Um, Jamie, do you want to speak a little bit more to the Cost. Yeah, so the initial cost, I believe, is like, Jackie, correct me if I'm wrong, $1,800. Um, and the plan was to attribute that to COVID because part of the reason why we need good electronic documents is because of COVID. We're not congregating all in a room. Um, moving forward, it would be about $4,000 yearly. Um, and that is something that I was planning to put on the finance budget. Um, the program itself is awesome. I, we can pass out the email for the demo, but you can 
pick parameters of different things that you want to be pulled into your um, budget books. You can print single pages. You can, there's just a million different little things that you can do, run reports and look at um, revenues or expenditures in any different way, add things you can put in departments, take departments off, things like that. Um, so that's just something that we thought to think about. Um, and another really wonderful thing about it too is that Jamie can upload the actuals from SoftWrite right into this program. And then as the department heads submit their budgets, they actually submit an Excel right to this program and it submits it so that, you know, um, prior to the budget day, we have all the submissions and you guys would have that in much more advanced than normal. And, you know, say Jim, tonight you were citing some, some percentages about our use of free cash over time. And I know I calculate those every year and I put them in the commentary for the warrant book. But say you're putting together a presentation, you want to have a discussion with a, you know, a member of the school committee or you want to, you're a liaison and you're going to be speaking to Public Works. This would allow you to go into Public Works' off, um, budget and you can set parameters for like, I want to see capital over time. I want to see capital as a pie chart of the greater Public Works budget. I want to see Public Works as a pie chart in the scheme of the overall budget. So it gives you all the tools to really get into the weeds that you might want to get into sometimes that we don't always provide for you in that, you know, we have a limited scope of time together and we don't want to just make you walk you through, you know, a thousand different charts in a given meeting. That's not necessarily helpful consumable information, but in a moment where you do want to do a deeper dive in into a particular department or a particular policy area, this is going to allow you to see all of those actuals what we're planning, what we've voted, and what we're planning to um, pr propose for the next year, all in one place. So, and it also, that function won't just be limited to the FinCom, it also be, will open to residents. So it's a huge transparency component. You know, we work and do our best to get our spreadsheets and our charts and our presentations up on the website, where you record your meetings. Um, but this, to me, just does add a really great uh, transparency, public engagement component. Um, you know, it's hard to engage folks on the budget process. It's really dense. They want to kind of talk about what they want to talk about. And this would allow residents to have that similar kind of uh, capacity to engage with our numbers. Um, so it's just, I think something Jamie and I couldn't not consider this year, um, given that we won't have our usual intern support. Um, we won't have our usual volunteers when we're updating the binders and putting them together. So it made sense to, to think about it now, especially with, I think we're gonna be doing most of this budget process on Zoom. Uh, so I, we just wanted to pitch it and see how you felt. Jackie, is it seems like it's pretty user-friendly. I think it's very user-friendly. Um, you know, it's it's a web pla web-based platform. Um, you know, it has, in my opinion, I'm not a professional at this, but it seems like it's very, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act accessible for residents who have different needs. Um, and I think you, the best part is you don't have to be a, a numbers budget person to be able to find the information you're looking for. You don't have to be an Excel spreadsheet person to, to find the information you want. So Jackie, just to repeat, you said it's a $4,000 software or is it $4,000 a year with the, uh, or is that the licensing fee? Well, it's it's a web-based program, so it's four thousand dollars a year for the the contract of they yeah. they take our data, they update it, and they host um, host the website for us, where we'll link it to our website, and they host, and so that you know they can assist us and our department heads with the IT of getting documents uploaded. Okay, and then is there training because there's it may, it may, I'm just suggesting intuitive to one person is a mess to someone else. Sure. So is there a learning curve or any kind of training included with they that? Did, they did have video options available. And if they don't have an option where a trainer can come out, I know Jamie and I would be happy to put something together for the public that we could record and have a link to it. Um, but She's I think writing I a check you have to cash, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> I've written a lot of checks, Jamie's got a cash in the last month. Yeah. So yeah. probably ready to take the checkbook out of my hands. I'm excited yeah. to hand it to her. Uh, Jackie, you mentioned uh, when you first discussed this, this, we might be eligible for some CARES dollars to implement this. Is that still the case? Um, Jamie, do you wanna? Yeah, um, so 
for cares, you it you can only put it to money to you have to identify it as something that is not budgeted and it's strictly because of COVID. And I think we can argue that it is because we need these documents electronic and easily accessible for everybody. Um, and so that's how we would get we would use that initial amount to fund the first year. Do we have um, do we have uh, uh, resources in the reserve account to fund this uh, for this year? Um, so other than the recent reserve fund transfer for the TA search, um, FinCom has not, I don't think, approved any other reserve funds at this point. Um, I think we would start by looking within the current finance department budget. Um, there's been um, some transition in that office this year, but um, we would start there. And then um, if we can't find the money beyond what the CARES Act would cover from there, then we potentially would ask you for the dollars. So the max reserve fund transfer would be 4,000, but presumably if we, can, if we can find some dollars in the finance department budget, um, it could come in as less. Okay. I would prefer that Jackie look to see what we have available now, just in case that you may need the reserve, you know, fund later in the fiscal okay. year. So you aren't you aren't requesting from us tonight any action to approve dollars for this. You're going to explore it. it. I think, if I'm hearing correctly, everyone thinks that this would be a very viable uh, option. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing that we need to consider is that we would have to commit CARES Act dollars before December 31st because of the deadline right. we'll be running out for the CARES Act. So if the FinCom tonight had no appetite for a program of this nature, we would say, okay, um, but we wanted to get your feedback. And if we can you know, figure out the money between CARES Act and our existing budget, um, we would move forward. But you know, if, if folks don't have an appetite for it, it's just good to know before we invest that time trying to look to get the funding together for it. I think it sounds like a great idea and certainly would be beneficial to us to be able to go in and poke around. And I don't know, you just gain so much by doing that to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm generally supportive of uh, such programs, especially where we're lacking any, I, I think we need to be really mindful of the strain it places upon our limited uh, town resource, you know, town department resources. So every time in the past that we've emailed, you know, our, our finance director or Jackie, you know, or town accountant, like, you know, hey, give me these numbers. We get a spreadsheet back in return. It may not have been updated. Um, it requires manipulation and interpretation and is subject to errors. Uh, and out of out of dateness, right? This can be stale info. So that has tripped us up more than once, and through no fault of anyone's user error on on, on our part, on the receiving end, uh, at critical points uh, as we near, for example, town meeting, and where timeliness is key, and where everyone is most stressed, not just <laughs> physically or emotionally, but for time, right? And and the value of our uh, department's time. Uh, department employees time. So I, I, I'm supportive of it. The one thing I would just ask is um, send along a link so we can maybe poke around, just learn a bit about it mm. and then, and then explore competitors because where there's one good option, there are often others and you know, assuming they're all kind of web-based, relatively easy to start up. I'm not trying to say there's 50 to choose from, but there might be a couple. I will say um, just for you to know, we did talk, um, we did get a good price deal on this one. Uh, typically, they most of these companies charge based on your total budget, so they do like a sliding scale based on your total. And it would have been ten grand for a municipality with a budget of twenty one million. And I said, look, yeah, our budget's twenty one million, but you know, twelve off the top of that is going in a check once a month to the regional school district. So we're really only tinkering with the numbers um, for about eleven thousand at, at best. Do you think that you could put me in the category? of a lower budget and that's how we we're able to get the four grand. So I'm happy to, you know, reach out and see what else we can do for pricing. Um, but it, you know, I was, it was thoughtful of them to at least give us a break, you know, given that we don't get to, you know, the schools give us a number. So luckily we were able to not count that and I'm happy to look and see if there's other companies that would do a, a similar, similar deal. 
and what I like about this is the transparency and the availability for uh, our citizens to go in. You know, they may not have a general interest in the overall budget, but there's those who are interested in just the library, interested in just recreation or uh, personnel or whatever, and they have the option to go in there and get the proper information versus trying to determine it on their own and may not have, as Alex said, the right or updated information in front of them. Yeah, completely agree. Citizens can keep us on our toes. Right. Right. There's a ton of Monday morning quarterbacks out there. <laughs> and so I appreciate them looking at that. So I'm, I'm hearing from the uh, Finance Committee, uh, Jamie and Jackie and Tom, to, to move ahead with this project and uh, see if we can apply for the CARES dollars to uh, offset the cost. I think if we're if we're successful, as I think we're going to be, I'm optimistic that you'll get to see it at minimum. We'll send you the demo tomorrow, but the goal would be is to have something implemented in time for January 9th. Um, so that's our, our goal. Um, it's a little optimistic, but you know, we watch. I will the the demo you'll watch hopefully that we'll send to you. I, you watch them create a, a budget book in, in minutes. It's amazing to watch. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was nervous Jamie wasn't going to like it, and she loved it. She was like, this is great. Yeah, so, um, you know, I I say this with all of the compassion in the world. You know, you've got to be a little bit dorky to, like, enjoy going through budget spreadsheets, and this system looks like it's going to be a really, you know, fun, engaging way for residents to get this information. So okay, thank you for your support of this tonight. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda, moving along is the uh, FY22 budget schedule. Jamie, do you have that? Budget schedule? Budget schedule as far as, I'm sorry. Uh, it's on the, uh, I, my, I assuming this was put on here so that we could take a look going forward after January 9th. Is that, is that correct? So we have the January 9th meeting, oh, yeah. and, and I think then the FinCom, uh, we, we'll have to, uh, well, I mean, you have the budget schedule that we, there's been a budget schedule put forward already, right? right? Yeah. It's kind of general, it's not a whole lot of dates, but there, there, there you go. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know whether it was put on the agenda here for more spe uh, specificity, specificity. I'll have to drink some water for that. Um, or, or any other, uh, uh, you know, discussions or detail? Um, so Jim, I think we were just wanting to talk about, obviously it's a reminder for tomorrow night and a reminder for January 9th. Okay. Um, well, and then from there, um, typically we just try to find out a date of when the FinCom wants to start their regular Wednesday meetings in January. Right. If you feel right. like you want a couple of weeks after January 9th, or if you want to get going right away, um, I know Jim, you had mentioned you also wanted to schedule something on the books with the, the Hamilton FinCom. So I think it was just to get a sense. Um, you know, we have this kind of generic section of the bud budget schedule for yep. January and February. So we want to know how quickly you wanted to get going on Wednesdays in January and February. Um, so that way, Jamie can work with Marissa on um, getting something set up with Hamilton FinCom and we can start prepping department heads for when you're going to want to see them uh, back again after January 9th. Yeah, my, my, my sense is, and I'm, I'm certainly open to this from the uh, committee, is that we, we, uh, after, we'll have the meeting tomorrow night, which will certainly give us a lot to think about. And that, that brings us to the middle of December. I, I think probably it makes sense to begin to schedule our meetings after the January 9th uh, all day meeting and uh, probably a, a week or two following that meeting and then go forward uh, for probably every two weeks, I think is what we have typically done in the past. Am I my memory correct on that folks, Alex? Uh, we were meeting every few weeks if I recall correctly once we got going. This year's been a little bit different in terms of the steps and the timing. Right, no, I agree. That, that feels like the right cadence, I think there probably would be 
occasion to meet weekly in some of those you know, in some of those early months yeah. before, before we get to the actual weekly, it, I guess it, it depends upon the questions at hand and, and, and your assessment of, you know, whether we need to assemble in, right. in set in, you know, seven days versus 14 from a given mm -hmm. meet, and, and with the limited time to schedule, of course, and still adhere to open meeting law. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if we get into weekly, but that feels right. After you know, a couple weeks after the ninth meeting, mm -hmm. yeah. with the rhythm of every other week to start anyway. Right. So we should probably reach out the, after New Year's to our respective departments, right? So is that the week of the third or fourth? Start reaching mm -hmm. out and scheduling our calls. Okay. Yeah. Um, Just we haven't talked too much about the liaison process, but that's what I was thinking, David. That after okay. January 9th meeting. Um, we begin to sit down, call, sit down, whatever you're comfortable doing with the department heads that you're assigned to and review the budget after the January 9th kind of meeting. I think we're going to get, uh, uh, Gary has uh, implied this, that the, uh, the Board of Selectmen would like to have some uh, some benchmarks that they want to put on the table as well, and I want to discuss that actually because Gary emailed me today for tomorrow's meeting with the uh, school committee with some benchmarks that he'd like to put forward. But th that yes, th that seems to make sense to me to have the liaison assignments, have the meetings after the January, and mm -hmm. each liaison report back any updates, changes you know, capital kind of requests that maybe we weren't aware of or changes in capital, that, that kind of a, a process. Uh, one thing that I generally do is particularly, I believe this date, this year is January 27th, is when the governor files his budget, I generally go through it and do an analysis for the FinCon, uh, the select board and such. We'll obviously work with Jackie and Jamie on this, particularly also your local aid and have a presentation from the governors, how it goes through from the governor to the house. I'll probably be still here, maybe when the house budget is finalized and how there's any changes if there are. Uh, by the time this, and that's usually the end of April, uh, you probably will have a permanent TA in by when the Senate budget, uh, is through and that will be the end of May, unless they do this year, which they've done previously, but not recently, I believe, where there's a consensus revenue budget where the governor, the House and the Senate will all make the same determination that this is how much local aid that we're gonna be uh, approving this year. So then when you see the governor's number, you know that's this, the Wenham number also. So I'll be working on that. That's one thing that I enjoy working on besides the other items of the budget. So you'll always be updated regarding that. And if there's anything in the budget that impacts us. Jim, Jackie. Oh, and I think Jim, I also wanted to just remind you too that when we reconvene in January, um, I'm very excited to see the um, liaison roles at work and to get you know your feedback. Um, on that in that way. I think that's going to be a, a new communication tool that I'm excited to, to see the results of. Uh, at some point in January too, we're going to get back into the weeds um, on the revenue side of things, um, looking at all the different, you know, potential other revenue uh, strategies. I say all, not that there are very many, but we do want to get in the weeds with the FinCom on revenue again, as we did last year um, in January as well, if that's all right with you. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> That's a, that's a critical piece of the yeah. picture. Yes. <laughs> okay. So after the January 9th meeting, we'll uh, collect ourselves, um, begin to set up schedules, uh, get our liaison uh, contacts going. And maybe, I think Jackie, you mentioned to me, or Jamie, uh, that you have some further, Jamie, you've had experience with liaison assignments and maybe you could uh, in January, talk to us about that a little bit more. and. Because I've just defined it in a pretty general sense in that we're liaison to the departments. We're, we're not advocates for, we're not advocates against. 
where right. we become a little bit more expertise in that particular department, but there's probably more, more definition that can go, go along with those assignments as well. Right. Yeah. So my experience has been, there's been, um, there's like a chair of within the liaison group and it's either one or two uh, FinCom members that are assigned to each department. And it's kind of a way for the department head to discuss with FinCom their changes. And when we get together and their changes are what they're looking, what they're working towards. Um, and it's forecasting for um, future years, but specifically what they're, what they did in their budget, if they had to make any cuts, if they had to make, um, significant changes. Yep. And then fin when the department comes to present to FinCom as a whole, the liaison kind of will take the lead and then let the department um, speak on their budget. Right. That makes, that makes, uh, that's not inconsistent, at least with what I was thinking about what our role would look like. You know, once we sit down with them and after the January 9th meeting, the initial preliminary budget they, they, they submit. Yeah, it's it's almost it's like a just like a different perspective, I think, because I think when it comes to for me, especially on a financial point, I'm like, where can we save? Where can we save? And I'm looking at where can we save where you guys are coming at it from a different angle. Like, yeah, we need to save, but we also need to make sure that things are getting paid for and, and we're funding things. So it's just yep. different eyes and different ideas and right aligning budgets more to spending because I think that is tough, especially the way we have our um, object code set up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, fi finally, I just wanna just quickly uh, uh, summarize what my understanding is uh, for tomorrow night's meeting with the, uh, uh, with the uh, school committee and the other boards of selectmen and the finance committee. My understanding is this, correct me, Tom, Jackie, or anyone else if I'm misunderstanding is that uh, it's the school committee's meeting that um, Michelle Bailey as chair of the uh, school, school committee will quote host the meeting. Uh, we'll have the opportunity for each, I, I believe if I remember correctly from what Gary sent me that uh, the school committee will present first and then the towns will follow up with their presentations uh, Jackie and Yemi, uh, Jamie are um, putting together some slides uh, predicated on our, uh, our, our preliminary budget numbers uh, that we had the other day. I'll follow up with some general comments and then open it up to the finance committee for additional, additional comments. Now, Gary emailed me today with two, 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 uh, two pieces one that he would like to put on the table uh, for the school committee a two and a half percent uh, increment um, and no override. So in, historically, the way we've handled the override question is we, I think we addressed that Alex in March of last year and took a vote on it before town meeting. Um, we haven't had a, we don't even know if there's gonna be an override, <laughs> number one. Um, so I, I, my response to Gary on the override piece was that in the discussion segment of the, of the meeting is to say to the, which actually I've said to uh, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent of finance for the schools, that, a, that an override would be very, very difficult for uh, Wenham to endure and uh, to uh, support this year. Uh, but that isn't, you know, I, I think it is a, at the end of the process, it's the finance committee gives a favorable or unfavorable uh, position for the town warrant book as it's, as it's stated right in the town warrant book. But my thought was that we, I could at least speak to uh, the difficulty in uh, supporting uh, override budgets for this year. Does that, how does that sound to the committee and 
it's pretty general, it's pretty upfront, and it's not predicated on any real information yet. Just that, Which I think is exactly where you want to be at this stage. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I, my, if I may, my own recommendation or, or my personal feelings towards those uh, statements is to, is to not embrace them as a FinCom member alone. And I think in, in backing them as a committee, we risk setting the tone, uh, a, one that is not productive insofar as you can throw a number out there, two and a half, three percent. I understand it's a, it's designed to be symbolic, right? Of, hey, come in even lower than you never have before. I have no problem with that. Uh, if it's based on some, you know, rigorous or not even rigorous analytics of what we can afford. I think the affordability question is really what's key. Mm -hmm. Setting that aside, the the no override statement to me is they're only one half of the picture, right? There's a town side too. So the override or lack thereof, or it's not, it's not a yes or no, it's how much results from the culmination of the budget process. <laughs> Th right. That's the end result, not the beginning. So we're only just starting. So certainly it's our goal, I think, as a FinCom to have a balanced budget and to have one that, you know, weighs the burden of our residential taxpayers with the excellent services that the town has come to expect, inclusive of, of um, town hall and, this, and the original school district. But to say no override at this point, I, I don't even know what that means because that's not what we're solving in tomorrow night's meeting, I would, I would say. But I think it's also important when we're discussing overrides at all is the current environment. The current what, Tom? The current environment. Environment. Basically, uh, the pandemic and the situation we're in at this point. And um, whether it's something that's even viable uh, to go through. Well, I mean, we're, at the, we're at the early stages uh, of discussion on the budget. But I think that, we, we have to take that into account also. I, I agree, but I, I think a lot of these things we said in the past have fallen on deaf ears. So I'm curious to see what happens tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Well, George Jackie was raising her hand. I, I just wanted to remind the thing come as well that the reason that we're talking about affordability this early on in the process this year as well is that at this point, um, majority of the school budget, just factually, majority of the school budget is based on salary and all of their collective bargaining agreements are up this year. So I think it's from a staff perspective, in terms of affordability, it's important for the school committee who are re representing the schools on that negotiating team um, to understand where the town's affordability lies. So I think, you know, to Tom's point, it's important to think about the environment and the environment for us is that we've just finished up or soon to be finishing up um, one of our collective bargaining agreements. The other three are up for next year for fiscal 23, 22 is the last year of those contracts. Um, but all of those school agreements are up right now. They're being negotiated. Um, Hamilton's town manager is the one town seat this year. It switches back and forth. Um, but I think that's the piece that um, I wouldn't want to not think about in terms of when Jamie and I are crunching numbers and thinking about affordability long term. You know, I, I've now been with the town for a few years at this point every year. And it's always, you know, we always start in the negative and, and everyone does. You never start with a balanced budget. Um, but at this moment, this is one of the few years where they are in a position to be negotiating um, one of their biggest costs every year. So it's important for residents also to understand what the towns can afford um, when, you know, the, when we're at the table for these types of discussions. Um. Jackie, uh, uh, Jamie, um, I was going to touch base with you tomorrow after you put the slides together. Um, and so we just go over that. I, I wonder if it might be helpful if we could coordinate, uh, Tom, uh, I'll include you in this, um, 
a brief telephone call with Gary to make sure we're all on the same page around this issue of uh, override, timing, affordability, how that gets uh, kind of put forward out there. It's so early in the process. Uh, would that make would that make some sense if we could kind of get Gary a because that I, I got a very brief note from him around two and a half percent basically and and um, and uh, no over no no over <laughs> no override which I ex I did share back with him that's very early um, we can certainly put on the table the issue that uh, to support an override would be difficult this year, but that's about the extent to which I've gotten back to Gary on that issue. So. I mean, it sounds like we're all, we're in somewhat of an agreement on that right now. Is... Well, I don't know if Gary is, that's, that's that quite frankly, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure how he sees that statement of no override. I. I got back to him. I haven't heard. I haven't heard back from him how he might want to handle that. that. That's that's all I think. I think we're in agreement. Um, is is Gary? So it's it's a discussion with Gary that I just think we need to kind of finalize and put some closure closure to it. At least how how I'm seeing. If I'm gonna if I'm going to have some role in speaking in speaking to that issue uh, tomorrow, I want to. Uh, be clear for myself where Gary's at, where the selectmen are at. Uh, I have a good sense of where we're at. You know, it's just very early in the process, but so maybe tomorrow morning we could we could think about that. Or well, I mean, town hall is going to be closed. I mean, we're available for phone calls, but um, trying to coordinate that because of the um, impeding, you know. Come the impending storm. Uh, oh, we right. can, you know, depending upon how we could do that. But I think why, why, why don't it, I do this? Let me let me simplify it. Why, why don't I see if I can have a discussion with follow up with Gary on this uh, on this question myself, and see if he and I can kind of come to a uh, an agreement of how we want to uh, kind of discuss this and present that tomorrow night. Yeah. That because makes sense. We have, you know, very good numbers people here, and you know, they're, you know, they're looking at what the affordability is, and you know, we have a set amount of revenue. Obviously, we all know that comes in, yeah. and you know, that's generally the standard you have to go by. Yeah. I, I would also just, I would just echo like what David said earlier. I mean, we, we've led off the past, you know, five years that I can recall with. Um, an indication of the town situation and a summary of the of, of the, the the fiscal situation and affordability given certain assumptions and and of course the end result is only as good as those assumptions which play out in different ways so impressing upon them that our situation is not likely to become you know much better for various reasons um you know not limited to you know the iron rail situation other other matters um and just keeping it pretty straightforward um, and, 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 and clear as to how our budgeting process will unfold. Um, but all that we know at this stage is what we can afford. I, I, don't, I wasn't trying to suggest that we shouldn't say no override or two and a half percent. I just don't think from, from a FinCom perspective, that's the best use of the time. The, the, the select board absolutely can, can do that, right? They, they can have that motivation at this stage. I'm not saying they can't. But we're not. We're a separate committee, um, and I and are responsible for the budget, which may or may not include an override, and may or may not, you know, take different paths along the way. I, I think what you said right out of the gates, Jim, is right, and and I don't think you need to be lockstep with select board. Not trying to say that, but I think you're in the right, you know, mindset to coordinate those efforts and align the general interests, but. I, we don't, we're not sharing, um, we're one town, but we're two different views from a policy and fiscal perspective. Right. So we can have different different statements and opinions, of course. Thanks, Alex. So sure, cool. thanks. Um, Thank you. Just, just to add to this, John Prulidge, my counterpart in uh, Hamilton, he, he and I are gonna have a discussion tomorrow morning. They're meeting tonight, they meeting the FinCom in Hamilton. 
and he just wanted to get a sense of kind of where we're at and how we might be approaching some of the issues tomorrow night as well. And they want to be, I think they're looking, they're very concerned about looking at an override for the first time in some time. Uh, I don't know what some, how long it has been since they've had an override, but they're concerned about that issue as well. Yeah, I thought they had uh, one this year. Excuse me? No, they, they had one on the warrant. Make it look like an override for the oh, school last oh, yeah. year. Thank but, you, but David. I, yeah. yeah, I had forgotten oh, that. Thank you. Don't don't thank me yet. I have a favor to ask. Um, so <laughs> can I can I see where we were in 2016, the, the, the rate to where we are now going forward, and on that traje trajectory over the last four or five years, what year are we gonna hit our max at 25? The tax rate specifically? Yeah, so I think around, I, I, I'm using round numbers, but I think we're like um, 16 in 2016. And then a couple of years, you know, last year, the year before we were at 18 and now we're over 20. So that's roughly a 25% jump, I think, in the last four or five years. So if we continue that, I think that might be a good visual, at least for me to see of where what kind of trajectory we are getting to to 25. Yeah, that would be interesting. That's, and that's the cap. And then we're, okay. I, yeah, I, I think that's definitely a useful exercise. I might suggest that it's not based on the rate of change of the tax rate alone, which might've been close to, you know, nine or 10% last year estimated um, to get us from the eight, 18, there we go. to the 2060 that we're at from the, um, yeah, 1802, it looks like. 1802. Yeah, so, that ends in 2019. Yeah. Fiscal I mean, we need a couple. Right. We're we missing two 20. years. Oh, oh, we're actually, yeah, 21. Right now, we're just setting the tax rate for 20, though. For so 20, is, right. Yeah, so this is not, so we're missing one year, which I know from Jamie, uh, we had the tax rate classification hearing last night with the select board and the assessors. So we're, we're only missing one year. Obviously, right. this chart does not factor for assessed valuation over time either. So yeah. that's the you know the issue. So would it be helpful, just to, as an example, I can we can send you a copy of this chart and we can try to find the median assessed value for each of these years to put it in a little bit of context. Is that kind of what you're looking for, David? Yeah, let me just. Or, I don't want to extend the meeting any more than we have to, but if we're twenty. Uh, David, are you asking, David, are you also asking for the average tax bill over that period of time? No, I was trying to make a point of that. If if we go up 20 percent 20 in the last five years, by twenty twenty six, we're going to be at our max, I think, by the rate we're going. And I don't know if that's correct or not. So it, it's not out of the realm of possibility, and it's the right question to ask so there are, there are a few ways of answering it or taking a stab at answering it I say. yeah so maybe if i can just work my own um jim is that your slide or is that jackie who brought that up that was uh, that, that was, was jamie's i think or jackie's oh, thanks jamie Jack, would you mind just forward me just that slide yeah we can send that to you and i'll take it so i just want and then i'll confirm with you if my i mean Alex, you're better at math than I am, but and, and Jamie, but we're just to make sure I'm having the right right year in mind, ballpark of when we're going to max out. And yeah. the other thing, so, go ahead, Jack. I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to clarify though. The one thing that you can't, we won't be able to factor for David is when we do see jumps in assessed value. So, like for example, a few years ago we saw the reval, and we had a significant impact to our assessed values. So the when you think of that tax rate calculation, you're taking the assessed value as well as the amount that we're budgeting in a given year to get to that tax rate. So um, it may be helpful to you when you're looking at that chart, if I can have C Steve send you the assessed valuation, the total assessed valuation over that same time period. Um, just, you know, I think you're on the right track. It's a really good question, but as Alex mentioned, there's a lot of nuance. And one, I think the main nuance is that the, we have a struggle even predicting the tax rates that we put in the chart in the warrant book 
because we don't know what's going to happen with assessed valuation in a given year. So it's, that what? it's not perfect, isn't it? Yeah, so that calculation was based on if there was no change at all to um, last year, which there there is change. So it's it's an estimate and it's a rough estimate. And like Jackie said, it's really hard to calculate um, your your rate. You can get ballpark, but even sometimes the ballpark doesn't get you as close as one would like. Agreed. So I think from that... Jane, would you mind putting it up one more time and then I'll make the motion to adjourn. Just <laughs> we can go, but um, uh, the second column, we can get a trend at least of the assessed value to figure it out. And, and what I'm looking for is not rocket science. Like I said, it will be a ballpark figure okay. that you would say past performance is X. So we're looking around here. So that that's, that's just it. I know it's going to be off um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, assuming is one thing, but at least it'll give, uh, help me give a visual of, uh, thank you. So if we have the max levy line available, we can get a trend for the last 17 years, percentage wise of what's happened and, and then the tax levy. So we can, it's, you know, future value of dollar, you know, investments, you can just run a couple formulas that we can try and figure out where we're looking. Cause I know there's that anomaly year, was that 08? Um, yeah, where it went a lot, like in two years from 07 to, to 10, it went, it, it went, jumped a lot and then we went higher. So, okay. So it's really that slide of, I can't really, uh, screenshot now, but if you can send me that slide, that would be great. Yeah. David, I'll send you, um, I have this in, in a, um, an editable chart so I can send that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The other, the, other, the other question I had, I went online to try to find language in the two and a half um, uh, budget law uh, as what happens when we, a community reaches 25, the $25 mill rate. Um, does that mean it's absolute, and these are questions, I, I, I mean, they're not, I don't, I'm just throwing them out. Does that mean absolutely that a community cannot expand beyond that 25 and others? Could we not even do a, a two and a half levy limit expansion or? I, was, I would think no one's done it, but um, you could probably, you know, I don't know. I'm gonna make, I'm not gonna make guesses. I, mean, I think 25 is the most, but if, if, the, if the taxable levy limit goes up, I mean, you would get as high percentage as you could, but not break 25 again. I, I just, think. I'm just curious as whether uh, any uh, time you've ever run across this, the language in that, in that um, legislation that occurred in what 91, 92, somewhere in there, uh, that that once you get there, that's it. There's no more, <laughs> there's no more room for anything. Is that so? I've that's never, I've never reached that limit. I have worked in a couple towns where you um, basically had a split tax rate so that you had the commercial, the businesses were taxed at a higher levy. So we right. never reached that. Right. Well, to be continued, I'll, I'm going to continue to do some, see if I can do some more research online about that, what the language is in that, uh, in that whole legislation that's uh, now 25 plus years old. Yeah. All right. Uh, beating out the dust. Anything else? Legal bills. You would. I thought we were going to get a projection for legal bills. We did, and I got it. Thank you very much. I got it from uh, from Nikki, and I think Jackie has a slide on that, but I can give it to you What where we stand uh, thus far. I was anticipating okay. this actually for the start of the meeting, <laughs> that we may have uh, visitors and uh, uh, citizens who may be interested in this. Jackie, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, up from September of 2019 till October of 20, October 2020, we have expended $12,160 in the 
line that says uh, uh, town hall complaints. This so far this year, and that corresponds with my addition here, we spent just over $3,000 uh, this year, uh, July, August, September, October. And N Nikki shared with me that she anticipates November to be uh, at, at least the October number of 2000. So if you add that all up, I guess we will say that uh, from September of uh, September 2019 to November of this year, we will have expended approximately, I say approximately because we don't have November exactly, about $14,200. Okay, the other question I have is, as far as insurance goes, if the town loses the suit, does the insurance cover the entire thing or is there a deductible or what happens? I'll defer that to Tom because I think it depends on the outcome and the findings of the suit. Okay. All right, any, anything regarding any insurance claims period in the town, let's say, um, you had a fire truck crash or a uh, building burnt down, any type of major claim uh, our insurance policy may affect the rates for the following year. Uh, but, but what about deductibles and, and all of that? I mean, or, it, or in fact, if somebody did something that was outside of the town business, is it covered? I'm not going to dis, you know, particularly discuss you know, any type of ongoing litigation at this time. But I'm not asking you to discuss the litigation. What I'm asking you is to interpret like the insurance policy. No, oh, I'm asking okay. you, what I wanna know is what it, the insurance policy says. It would make the, the insurer insurance company to policy would have to make that determination. So any, we don't know. Any claim, any claim, the insurance policy, insurance, not the policy, the insurance company would have to make the determination if it is a covered claim or not. Okay, because I'm only saying this because believe it or not, I've worked for a large construction company who had a particular policy for incidents like this because the owner was prone to saying the incorrect thing or whatever. And it was a very different policy from like the GL. So I was just curious. Okay. But they make the determination of whether it's, it's a covered claim or not. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry if I sounded you know, abrupt on that. I apologize. So we'll, I did. we'll, 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 uh, We'll, we'll track uh, these expenses uh, going forward, I think probably on a monthly basis, because I think the citizens will have questions about this from time, from time to time as to the expense side of it. Yeah, very important to track. Thanks for keeping it in front of us. And I personally appreciate any, I'm not asking <laughs> that, that the town to drop everything and notify us. We email when we get a bill from, I guess it's KP Law for this particular item, but any updates along these lines are, yeah. Yeah. Of, of well, I think the increases are important. Right. The advantage is that KP Law is only billing out as what, $175 an hour? Right. Which is like, I don't know, in my book, a bargain. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so, I, I mean, that's it could easily be double that. So I think that's very helpful. Um, anyway. Uh, Nikki, Nikki is the individual, uh, I think that's still the case, who tracks uh, all the legal, legal bills. So uh, she's been very cooperative. She sent me today this, uh, an email as well as uh, 15 pages of detailed billing over the past, which I, uh, I got on my uh, on my phone and I could barely read them all, but she's been very cooperative in uh, getting us that information. Great. She's, cooperative. she's always great. cooperative. She's been very efficient <laughs> in getting us that information. 
All right. Any other uh, any other new business? Um, so I'll see people tomorrow night at seven o'clock. Uh, do I hear a motion uh, to ad to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye, David. Aye. Aye, Susan. Aye, Alex. Thank you very much. Mm. See everyone Thank tomorrow you. night at uh, seven o'clock for one more round uh, with the school committee and finance and board of selectmen. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, family. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye.